Please would you open your Bible at our second reading, Luke chapter 19, we read from verse 11. Now, the beginning of a new year is an appropriate time for reflection. It reminds us that time is passing. Probably all of us here can think of friends or members of the family, people who were part of our lives one year ago, who are no longer with us. Some can look back to significant changes in your own life in the last year. Some of us expect very major changes in the year to come. As a church, we expect significant changes. And in the nation, we expect changes with a new president and a new government. And the Bible encourages us to reflect very seriously upon the passing of time. As for men, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, you have made my days as handbreadths, and mine age is as nothing before you. Surely every man at his best estate is but a vapour. You do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is a vapour that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It is good to pause to remember that our life is short, that none of us will be here forever. And the Bible encourages us to give serious consideration to the direction to the course of our life. Your life is the most precious gift that you have. What are you doing with it? What are you aiming at? What are you achieving in your life? When you were at school, you had regular assessments to see how you were doing. Were you making the grade? Were you falling behind? And in life, we need to stop and to have assessments. We need to pause and ask how we are doing in our life. Now, the Bible uses a number of pictures to describe the Christian life. It uses images such as these. It speaks of our life as a race. It speaks of it as a contest. It speaks of it as a fight. It speaks of it as a warfare. Let me read you some verses which use these pictures. 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize, Run in such a way that you may attain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. I fight thus, not as one who beats the air. I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself 
to become disqualified. Or Paul in the very last chapter of the New Testament that he wrote, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says concerning his own life, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Ephesians 6.12 he says, for we do not wrestle, or uh, literally, it says, our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. And you see these various pictures of the Christian life, which the Bible uses, each one of them, speaks to us of the need for a clear purpose and serious effort and determination in aiming at that purpose. You cannot casually run a race. Someone who is running a race doesn't stop every now and then at a wayside cafe to have some merienda. He is running a race. He has to do it with purpose and with determination. An Olympic athlete does not compete without the most serious self-discipline. You certainly cannot be victorious in a battle if you fight half-heartedly. And so Peter says to us, gird up the loins of your mind. Be self-controlled. That picture of girding up the loins, of course, it's taken from the practice of the ancient world. A man would have a long robe, but when he was about to engage in serious manual work, he couldn't have his robe flowing down to his ankles. He had to gird it up, tuck it in around his waist in order to be ready for serious physical activity. And Peter says, gird up the loins of your mind. Be ready for serious thinking and serious action. Be self-controlled. There is effort. There is seriousness of purpose in the Christian life. And here in this chapter in Luke 19, our Lord uses another picture of the Christian life. This is not the, 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 the picture of a race or a battle or an athletic context. This is the picture of men doing business. And he gives us this picture of the Lord who is going away and he calls ten of his servants and he gives to each one of them a sum of money. The money is a mina or a mina. It is um, the equivalent in those days of something like three months wages. So it was not a phenomenal sum, but it was a sum with which these men could work and do business. And he gave them the command as he left them, do business, trade until I come. And then he left them for a period of time. And during that time, the Lord went off to a distant country to receive a kingdom and to return. Now, that might sound a rather strange element in the story. Why is this Lord going off to receive a kingdom? Well, undoubtedly, the picture is drawn from relatively recent history. Recent, that is, at the time when Jesus was presenting this picture. Because, you see, 30 years before, Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great, had gone to Rome. He had gone to Rome seeking to be appointed as king over part of his father's kingdom. The Jews did not want him to be their king. 
And so they sent a delegation to Rome asking Caesar to refuse his um, plea to be appointed. Well, they were partly successful in that Archelaus was in fact denied the formal title of king, although he was in practice given a great deal of the power. Now, our Lord is clearly alluding to that, and he is using the picture of this man going off to, to Rome, to the very heart of the, the Roman Empire, in the hope of being appointed king and returning as king. But he's using it as a picture of himself. He's using it to speak of his own leaving this world to go to the Father and there to be enthroned as Lord of Lords and King of Kings and one day to return in power and in glory and to call all mankind into judgment before his throne. And the period of his absence, his physical absence, is the period in which you and I are living out our Christian lives. We, in this period, when Christ is no longer physically in the earth, but is enthroned before the Father, we have work to do. We have a race to run. We have a contest in which to engage. We have business to be done. Our Lord has in effect said to each and every believer, I have given you gifts, I have given you abilities, do business with them, make a profit with them until I return. And when the Lord comes again, he will ask each and every one of us, what did you do with your life? How did you spend the gifts and the opportunities? How did you spend the days and the months and the years that I gave you in this world? Did you do business? Did you trade with these things? Did you make a spiritual profit? What have you to show for your life in this world? And so you see, it's appropriate, it's necessary that we should give attention to these questions in advance. Let us not wait until the Lord appears and asks them of us. We need to ask ourselves, what am I doing with my life? What are my aims? What are my ambitions? What am I doing about them? What progress am I making? In thinking about these questions, of course, the most basic question of all is this. Are you a Christian? In the parable, have you noticed that there are three classes of person mentioned? There are two faithful servants who, when their Lord returns, they are rewarded for their faithful service. There is one unfaithful servant. Outwardly, he is a servant. The reality is that he is a hypocrite from the very beginning. He does not represent a true Christian, but a mere outward Christian, a nominal Christian, deceiving himself that he is a Christian. And then there's the other group, the generality of the citizens. The citizens who hated their Lord and made no secret of it. And the fact is, you see, that each and every one of us fits into one or other of these three categories. One or other of these categories describes you. If you came here, as I presume that you did, 
of your own free will this morning. No one held a gun at your head and said, you are going to church. If you came here voluntarily, presumably you do not fall into the third category. Those who hated the Lord, made no secret of it, sent a delegation asking that his um, plea should, for, for kingship should be rejected. We do not want this man to reign over us. Presumably, you are not in that category because you are here this morning. But you see, it's altogether possible that you could be in the middle category. You could be a Christian in name only, with no commitment of heart to the Lord Jesus. You see, to be a Christian is much more than simply attending church. It's much more than being a decent person, a moral person. It's much more than simply believing certain doctrines, even if they are Protestant and Reformed doctrines. The Bible says that with the heart a man believes unto righteousness. It's much more than simply an academic assent to propositional truth. Important though that is, yet there is much more to it. It's not simply with the brain believing, but from the heart believing. It involves loving the truth and loving Jesus Christ. Paul says, if anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Jesus says, he who does not love me does not keep my words. And you see, it's clear this, um, this man in the parable, the man who, who did not do business, who did not trade, who simply handed his mina back at the end of the day, it's clear that he had no love for his Lord. He says to him, Master, here is your mina which I kept put away in a handkerchief, for I feared you, because you are an austere man, a hard man. You collect what you did not deposit, you reap what you did not sow. He is a man who has no regard at all, no respect, and certainly no love for his master. And you must ask yourself the question, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you love his person, the eternal Son of the Father, the one sharing the glory of the Father from all eternity, and the one becoming man for us, being born of the Virgin, laid in the manger, living and dying for sinners. Do you love his spiritual beauty and perfection, perfect righteousness and holiness and love blazing with indignation against the impenitent but full of compassion and full of mercy for those who repent. Do you love him for his unspeakable love for sinners? While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And have you entrusted yourself into his hands, into the hands of the one who is the saviour of sinners, the one who is able to save completely those who come to God by him. And are you seeking to live from day to day by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you? If you're not a Christian, then the remaining questions will be irrelevant. 
But if you're not a Christian, will you not do something about it today? The Bible says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Will you not, if you are not a Christian here this morning, will you not call upon the name of the Lord and become a Christian through faith in the Lord Jesus today? But now let's suppose that you are a Christian. Let me ask you a question. What are you aiming at in your life? If you're a Christian, your aims and ambitions have got to be different from the aims and ambitions of people who are not Christians. You are not called just to go on living for the same things that other people live for. Other people live for earthly happiness in one form or another. Some of them live for money for wealth, for prosperity. And Jesus says very plainly in the Sermon on the Mount, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all necessary things will be added to you. See, as a Christian, you are called to a far, far higher aim and purpose than the non-Christian can ever contemplate. You are called to seek and to promote the glory of God in this world. You have that in the Lord's Prayer. When Jesus teaches us how to pray, he says, pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, your name be hallowed. That is, your name be esteemed as holy. Your name be feared and known and loved and trusted. Your kingdom come. Your will be accomplished on earth as in heaven. You are to have this as your principal prayer the expression of your principal aim in life that God may be glorified in this world. That God may be glorified in your life, in your family, in your church, in your society. That God may be glorified throughout the whole world. Man's chief end is to glorify God. And that is your calling as a Christian believer that you are not to live in order to have a comfortable bank balance, in order to have a decent retirement pension and comfort in your old age. You are not to live simply for earthly and material things. You are to live for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Well, what does that mean in practice? We need to break that down. It's no good simply saying, oh, my purpose is to glorify God, unless we have some understanding in what way we are called to glorify him. First of all, you are called to glorify God in what you are as a person. To glorify God in your moral 
and spiritual character. Glorifying God does not begin with what you do, it begins with what you are. Doing is very important, but being is more important still. We see that, for example, in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount does not begin with our Lord giving instructions or commandments. He begins with statements about the spiritual character of those who are truly blessed. He speaks about the character, the effects of being convicted of sin, the realization that we are spiritually bankrupt, the poor in spirit, inward sorrow on account of it, blessed are those who mourn, a changed attitude towards others because of it, blessed are the meek, the gentle. He speaks about the inward yearning to be right with God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. He speaks about the change of heart that comes about in such a person. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. He speaks about the willingness to suffer for Jesus' sake. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And these things are not primarily about doing, they are about being. They are a description of the inward person. They are a, a description of a spiritual character that belongs to the man or the woman who is in a position now to live for the glory of God. But it begins with what you are. How can you be what God calls you to be? First of all, of course, again I say, you must be a Christian. You must have saving faith. You must call upon the name of the Lord. But then, as a Christian, you also need to be active in seeking to be what God calls you to. The Bible says, pursue, follow after holiness without which no one will see the Lord. How are you to do that? First, you must be serious about the Bible. Jesus prayed to the Father concerning his disciples, sanctify them, make them holy, through your truth, your word is truth. You need to be serious about the word of God. You cannot be what God wants you to be apart from the Word of God. The Word of Christ, the Word of God, must dwell richly in your heart. If God's Word abides within you, then it will bear fruit within you. It will change your character. It will bring you into conformity with what God desires for you. But if you neglect the Word of God. How are you going to be what God wants you to be? You cannot. You cannot be as a Christian. You cannot grow as a Christian apart from the Word of God. Are you serious about the Word of God? Are you serious about personal Bible reading. Do you read the Word of God? Do you set aside time to read it, to pray over it, to meditate upon it, to ask how does this apply to me? What is God saying to me? How am I to work this out in my life? 
Are you serious about hearing the word of God? God has not only given us the Bible as a book that we can have personally in our own homes, he gives us it through the public ministry of the church, through pastors and teachers expounding, preaching the word of God. How are you, how do you relate to the hearing of God's word? Are you diligent in being present when the word of God is preached? Are you negligent about these things? Again, I say you cannot grow as a Christian. You cannot be what God wants you to be as a Christian apart from the word of God. Another thing you need to be serious about is prayer. Prayer is the very easiest aspect of the Christian life to neglect. It is so hard to maintain a life of prayer. It is one of the greatest struggles of the Christian life to be consistently a praying man or woman. And yet, again, I say that you cannot be what God desires you to be without maintaining a life of prayer. We need to ask God to work in our hearts. We need to pray over the scriptures. Are you serious about your prayer life? And if you have not been until now, then I ask you, will you become serious about it today? If you've been neglecting God's word, reading it privately, being present when it's preached and taught, Will you change? Will you have a different attitude in 2016 to the attitude that you had previously? And in prayer, will you become serious? Will you set aside time on a daily basis to spend time seeking God that he might have dealings with you? And then, in addition to this, as well as your um, personal life, what you are, you are to glorify God in your church life. What you are personally as a Christian is inseparable from what you are as part of the church. We live in an age of individualism, including a great many individualistic Christians. Christians for whom the church plays a minimal part in their spiritual life. And the New Testament knows nothing of that kind of Christianity. In the great epistle to the Romans, the first 11 chapters are teaching about the gospel of salvation. And then, from chapter 12 onwards, the apostle begins the practical application. What does this mean in practice for us in our lives? And he begins with a couple of summary verses about presenting our bodies a living sacrifice and being transformed inwardly by the renewing of our minds. That's a kind of total picture. And then he begins to break it down in detail. What does that mean in practice? What does it mean in detail? And the very first thing he deals with is our relationship with the church, with the body of Christ. As we have many members in one body, but all the members don't have the same function, so we Christians, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members one 
of another. And you cannot glorify God as a Christian isolated from your church. The story is told of a certain minister who was visiting a church member who was absenting himself frequently from the church. And he went to speak with this man, but he didn't raise the matter of his um, poor attendance. But he sat down, um, you must understand this wasn't in the Philippines, he sat down by the, by the hearth, by a blazing fire in, in the living room. And he sat and chatted to the man. But as he sat down, he took the tongs that were beside the fire and he carefully removed a glowing piece of coal from the fire. And he set it aside on the hearth outside by itself. And of course what happened? As they talked, he said nothing about his reason for doing it. But of course, what was originally that glowing coal part of the whole fire, of course it simply cooled down and became black and ceased to burn. And he was trying to put across to the man the message that you're isolating yourself. You're separating yourself from the body of Christ. You must be part of it. If you are to maintain your spiritual life, you must be there, part of the flame. Not isolated, set apart, all by yourself, and simply sizzling out. If you are a member of this church, you have a part to play in the church. The fact is that the church cannot function without the active commitment and participation of its members. Let me ask you, are you present when the church comes together for worship? Are you reliably there? Can we assume that you will be here? Where are you when there is a church Bible study? Can we assume that you will be present, that you will be there? Where are you when the church has its prayer meeting? Will you be there? Will you be in your place? Are you committed to the life and the well-being of the church? The church, I say simply, cannot function without the commitment of its members. Where do you stand? And again I ask, are you willing to consider and to change your way? Another area in which you are called to glorify God is of course in your family. And the Bible addresses quite explicitly and in detail what is God's plan for the family. The Bible speaks to Christian wives. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife. Let the wives be subject to their husbands in everything. That is God's pattern. If you are a Christian wife, then you are to glorify God within your family by your acknowledgement of the headship of the one whom God has set over you and by your submission to your husband in the Lord. The Bible speaks explicitly to husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And that is the calling 
of the Christian man if he is married. He is to love his wife according to the pattern that Christ has given us in his love for the church. The Son of God came from heaven that he might redeem his church. The Son of God went to the cross of Calvary that he might redeem his church. And God says to us in his word, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That is a high demand. But it is glorifying to God when a Christian couple live together, the husband loving his wife, the wife living in loving submission. The Bible speaks to children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. And it is right that children should be brought up in the nurture and the discipline of the Lord, brought up to respect, to honor father and mother. And the Bible speaks also to parents, you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And surely there is nothing more glorifying to God than a truly Christian family. A family united by faith to Jesus Christ. A family indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God living together in obedience to the revealed pattern and will of God. And one area that we ought to examine as we reflect upon these things is our family life. How are you doing in your family? Are you glorifying God? Are you advancing the kingdom of God in your home? And then you are to glorify God in relation to the world outside. The Bible speaks about our life at work. It expresses it in terms of slaves and masters, because that was appropriate to that day. But the principles are applicable to our working life today. Colossians chapter um, 3, bond servants... Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. And masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And you see, we need to ask, how are you doing in your working life? Whether you are employed by somebody, or whether you are employing others, are you glorifying God in your worldly business? Are you working as unto the Lord? Are you working with honesty and with integrity? And if you are an employer, are you dealing fairly and properly and justly and kindly with those who work for you? In these things, we are called to glorify God. We are called to advance the kingdom of God by the manner in which we perform our daily work. And then it also speaks, the Bible also speaks about our relationship 
with the state. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Therefore, render to all their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Are you living rightly? Are you living a God-pleasing life in your relation to the state? Do you pay the taxes that are appropriate and proper for you to pay? Do you seek to fulfill your duties as a Christian living in, <clears throat> living in this society? And then, finally, the Bible speaks about our relationship with all mankind. Romans 13, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Live peaceably with all men. Do not avenge yourselves. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And Peter says this, Have your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Are you seeking in the totality of your life in this world, not only in relation to yourself and to your church and to your family and those at work or school or wherever, but wherever you are, in whatever context, do you seek to behave as a Christian towards all men? Loving as you ought to love, respecting as you ought to respect, and leading others to glorify God because of your Christian life. Well, let me just repeat the questions. Are you serious about your Christian faith. Do you say that life is not a stroll by the riverside? Life is a race. It is a contest. It is a, a fight. It is a warfare. It is, as in this parable, a matter of doing business, seeking to use what God has given to produce fruit for the glory of God. Are you serious? about your faith? Are you serious about applying it in your own character and in your own life? Are you serious about your church membership? Does membership really mean something to you? Does it actually involve commitment to the people with whom you worship and serve God? Are you serious about seeking the advancement of God's kingdom <clears throat> wherever God has placed you in this present world? Is it your hope to hear one day the Lord's commendation, well done, good and faithful servant, May God speak to all our hearts. Amen.